2018 was a great year for my agency, Secret Sushi. We were helping a slew of great clients grow and experienced quite a bit of growth ourselves. We added some new team members and filled some very important roles that would allow us to continue to help our clients grow, scale the agency, and last but not least, allow me to invest more of my personal attention into molding my agency into the business that I wanted it to be. I've never felt more like a CEO than now. That's what I recently told a friend. Not because of any amount of money we made or being in the position of being quote unquote the boss. It was in large part because of the new and larger challenges that naturally pop up when your team grows. I've learned what makes each human a special and productive contributor to the work we do equally requires managers and leaders, in this case me, to pay even closer attention, listen, and engage with each of the people on my team. Years of being in business had shown me how hard it could be to find great humans to work with, let alone join your team. I was lucky to have only rarely dealt with anyone but the best of people. Wanting to carry the momentum of 2018 into the next year, I planned an offsite with key members of my team. The goal was not only to communicate what we needed to do for the next 12 months, but even more so to listen and learn from my team what was on their mind and how it could get us not to just roughly look in the same direction, but all be driving in the same car to the same destination. Not to leave you hanging, but that's where the topic of today's episode comes in. My guest Janet Fouts and I talk about mindful team building for business leaders. Janet is a mindful and emotional intelligence coach, best-selling author, speaker, corporate trainer, and a longtime friend of mine. If you're leading a group of great human beings, or one of those great human beings yourself trying to learn how to elevate the work that you do with others, I think you're going to enjoy what Janet has to say. And don't forget to listen to the end to learn where you can find out more great insights about digital marketing strategies and marketing tactics to grow your business. Here's my interview with Janet Fouts. Happy, happy afternoon or morning or maybe evening. Maybe it's midnight. Maybe I'm talking to you while you're sleeping. You've put me on your ears just before bed and you have passed out. And I'm subliminally talking to you while you're slumbering. I hope, um, I, I hope you're dreaming of me there. My name is Adam and I am talking to Janet Fouts, uh, a great, great friend. You guys can't see, but she's over there cracking up. Uh, hey, I was going to snore, but I decided not to. You're going to snore or snort? <laughs> one, snore. One of the, snore. Uh, yes, please don't do that right now <laughs> while we're in the middle of, of talking. Uh, Janet uh, is one of my best friends in the world. And uh, Janet is, is, is an incredible person and a resource that I talk to quite often, not only about just sort of marketing in general, uh, because she's just a great, uh, a great brain to bounce things off of. But she has been my muse towards mindfulness uh, back in the day. And uh, I, I love talking with her uh, about that, about conscious business, about mindfulness. And today's topic is about mindful or conscious team building. Whatever term you want to put around it will help peel back things a little bit more so you'll understand it. Um, but, you know, Janet, I remember it's got to be a couple years ago that you, you shared with me this book called Conscious Business, um, which uh, I really, really loved. I, I got the audio book. I listened to it, to it through. And one, uh, one of the things I, I really enjoyed about it was it, uh, it, it, it was applicable. Like, you know, you, when you think of the words mindfulness and conscious you, you feel like it's a lot of fluffy talk. And, and, and again, it's, it's really like this soft skill that, you know, is nice to have, but that's not what businesses need. They need sales and gumption and all that sort of stuff. So let's, let's sort of demystify that a, a little bit. Can you remind folks who don't know, like when we, when we talk about mindfulness and consciousness, uh, or conscious business, that sort of thing. What are we really, in essence, talking about from a high level? Well, you know, a lot of these topics seem really fluffy, and what I say in air quotes is soft skills, but, and that's something that some people maybe discount a little bit. But, you know, um, both of the terms, mindfulness and conscious, just mean that you're actually paying attention. That's really the key. And, you know, that book that I gave you is written by Fred Kaufman, who's at LinkedIn. And 
it wasn't just the fact that he was really, really conscious about how he engaged in the book and how he ran his business. But the way the man talks is so amazing because he really has a consciousness of how he communicates with people. And it's really, in some ways, kind of old school, having respect for the people that you work with. And, you know, he's like, I don't come late to meetings. I come early to meetings because it's disrespectful to just show up whenever you feel like it. Very simple, very clean things that he said in that book just really resonated with me. And it's really because we've been so busy running on the treadmill as business owners. And both of us are CEOs of our own companies and we're working really hard. And sometimes we get so busy working and running on that treadmill and moving everything forward that we forget to stop and appreciate where we are and the team around us, the people that we work with, our clients and our team. So just doing that, just noticing, wow, this is pretty good. Not always, but most of the time. It's interesting because uh, as you were talking, it, 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 it sort of got my neurons firing about how, um, how much the team, you know, how much this is a really about sort of a, a, a leadership and team dynamic, how, how when, you, when, when, when Fred was talking about, it, obviously, there was a lot that had to do with sort of understanding your own values and your own um, sort of distractions and other things that, you, that, that matter to you to be paying attention to and the benefits of doing those things. But, but for the sake of this conversation, you know, we're talking about uh, team building. I mean, it, it, his book uh, and a lot of the work that you do goes into going beyond, obviously, understanding like how to, how to tackle uh, mindfulness and, and being conscious yourself in what you're doing personally and professionally, but also the, the impact that it has on, on, on you know, that, how that expands off to the rest of your team how you engage with your team. Um, I, I got to say that I, I said to somebody recently, never have I felt more like the CEO of a, more, more like a CEO period than I have this year because of the, honestly, the, the sort of mindful and consciousness element that I've um, uh, sort of tried to uh, intentionally interject into what we're doing. And it's not about me forcing my, philosophy down my team's throat, we really do have to work together and, and understand, um, and, and I've got to understand how to take responsibility for, um, for communicating a number of things as well as listening to them. Uh, how, how does, like, what responsibility do, do leaders have? Do um, business leaders, do, you know, leaders of particular units of, of individuals have, um, to, to sort of adopting or practicing um, some elements of being conscious and mindful with their teams? Well, you know, I've been doing a lot of training on this. And I just the other day, I did a training on really getting employees engaged in the company. And that was really around the responsibility of leadership to let people know what their role in the company is. You know, in the old days, uh, I worked in a Motorola factory when I was putting myself through college, and my entire job, eight hours a day, was to bend two little wires on a transistor and stick it into a circuit board and then pass it on to the next person. <laughs> it was the most horrific job in the world. And in fact, I never used a Motorola phone because I actually helped to build them. It's so like working at a pizza joint, right? You're like, no, no pizza for me tonight. I, I see yeah, too much pizza. It's also that... Okay, I was bending these resistors, and at the time, I, I was not into tech. I wasn't interested in it at all. It was a job. And I didn't even know what that transistor did. The meaning, the meaning of what you were doing. Yeah, there was no end purpose. I felt like a cog in a, in a wheel, and that was my only job. And it worked as I was in college, and I had lots of other things to do. But <laughs> it was really important that as I got into bigger businesses as I started working in other businesses. I wanted to feel like I was part of a mission or part of something successful. And, you know, I heard a story long ago about Kennedy that he went to NASA and he was 
giving the grand tour around NASA, and he ran into a janitor. And he said to the janitor, what do you do here? And the janitor said, I help us get to the moon. Now that's understanding your mission. Even though you're cleaning halls, you have a very important mission on the success of the company. And without you, they could fail. So we want to instill that in our employees. We want them to understand that there's a real purpose in your role in this place. Does that make any sense? It it does. So then how do you get there? How do you get to a point of, of, I mean, just just how do you get there? How do you get to the point where that janitor knows that and the other folks that might not, uh, might might be bending resistors uh, <laughs> under uh, understand the, the 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 greater purpose or even have any level of of pride in in any of that. Well, you know, I've been a geek for a long time. So if somebody had not then, but ever since, if someone had explained to me what I was doing and how it affected the overall end product, I might have been more careful. It might have mattered to me, but it didn't. And so, you know, if you've got somebody who's coding your website, for example, then talking to them about how the code that they just created has helped you to sell a better product or change lives, now they have a purpose. Otherwise, they're just coding, you know, HTML. It's, it's not important to them. They don't get vested and they don't really put any passion into it. It's just a job. Who do you want employed in your company? Someone who really cares or someone who's just putting in time and waiting to go home? So besides that end of the spectrum, right, where you're really talking about, uh, in in a way, uh, folks finding meaning within the company, or at least understanding their meaning to the point where folks can be happier, more productive, uh, take more pride in their work, do better quality work, whatever that. There's just a whole bunch of things that can happen from that perspective. But what about the other side of things when it comes to um, things like conflict resolution and, and you know, you, things that aren't day-to-day, hopefully, <laughs> within mm-hmm. your business, and instead are things that pop up and are really tough things to have to deal with, the dynamics between teammates and, and you know, not somebody maybe on, on the line doing something uh, uh, with, the, with the widgets on the, on the line. But with a team of, of folks, like, again, most of the folks that listen to this are, um, are, are, are marketers or marketing decision makers, um, folks dealing with sales and communications. What about those folks? How does this apply to, to the dynamics that they're dealing with on a, on a daily basis? That's such a great question because it's one that a lot of people don't think about very much. Um, you know, I have been in companies where marketing had all of these really great ideas and they were like, we're going to do this and it's going to be really great. And then the engineers would come in and go, yeah, we can't actually do that. And then sales would say, how come you keep trying to sell this stuff and market it when I, I got to go in and tell people whether this thing works or not. There's a lack of communication. There's a siloed mindset where we're not thinking about the organization as a whole. We're thinking about our little job and our little silo. And if we don't, as marketers, talk to the engineers and find out, you know, what is the real benefit to this? And, you know, when you sit down and and we've done this with um, engineers in the past where, okay, maybe they're not going to blog. Maybe they're not going to get on Twitter and talk about the product. But when you sit down as a marketer with an engineer and say, where does your passion for this project come from? What gets you excited? What's new that I don't really know about that's really going to get people jazzed about this? And then you take that language from that engineer and you use that to market the product. Wow, suddenly you're the voice of the product. And you're not just pushing out your own messaging. You're taking the passion from the person who created it or worked on it and using that it just comes across better because there's realness there that sometimes there isn't so much in marketing. Although we all deny it, that's pretty much true. I, I had a, uh, it was actually sitting down at the table with, with uh, our, our client, one of our clients uh, to today. 
And the discussion was really about marketing and sales alignment. Even though the, the intention was not to be about that, the conversation somebody flew in from 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 out of the country to to be there for the big meeting and so all the top people that were there talking about marketing and it immediately went into how do we get these these guys to to do what we need them to do or how do we get through to them to find out what it is that they need or whatever the case just just there was a plethora of, of little things that most I hear quite often from people with between their sales and marketing uh, teams and, and most of it boils down to a bit of, 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 of communication, a lot of communication in fact. Um, but, but communication in the sense of, of on the side of listening, because a lot of times they're wanting to sort of talk about what's important to them or how things uh, are or the way they, they should be or whatever the case may be from their perspective. But don't pause for a second and say, like, it's great that, you know, you're telling me all this, but we need to we need to pause for a second. And maybe instead of telling me how you think things should be, you know, listen to 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 those other to those other departments and try to um, be more conscious about how to figure out what really is the subtext behind what's going on, because they're hustling and bustling and they're on the same team as you. But people can oftentimes have a hard time communicating the right thing. And when two parties are just simply only communicating towards each other and not one of them or both of them are trying to, to actively listen at that moment, it could be really, really hard to um, inject any empathy beyond your situation um, or, you know, in your, in, in your department. And so it was really interesting to see the conversation expand beyond why can't these folks understand this, that, and the other to a path of somebody's got to give, somebody's got to be willing to be quiet for a little bit <laughs> and, and, and hold an active role in paying attention, being mindful and paying attention to that other party with, without the intention of, of, with the intention of listening and not the intention of responding. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and, 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 and I believe that after that, that sort of was accept, uh, accepted as a, as a way of moving forward, um, or at least uh, to continue the conversation from there, it was interesting to hear all the options open up because now it wasn't about trying to impart their philosophy on this other department, but instead it was about trying to understand the position or the needs of that other department and how they could be of service to each other or at least communicate better why, wh- where that disconnect was and, and, and alleviate that a, a bit. Mm-hmm. Does that, does that seem to be familiar? It, it's familiar with us in regards to sales and marketing. Does it seem to be familiar in, in what you've been seeing as well in your work? Yeah, I see it all the time. And, you know, it's really something that we don't really put out there very much, but it, it's really a cognitive bias. It's that, you know, and there are a lot of different kinds of cognitive bias. Um, An example might be planning bias. You know, the planning, they call it planning fallacy bias, where literally I'm, as a salesperson, underestimating the amount of time that you as an engineer are going to take to finish this product. And I'm already telling sales, you got to sell it. And sales is going, hey, you haven't talked to engineering that communication gap is something that is really critical that leaders take charge of that and help people recognize those biases and be able to manage that appropriately. And you can't see it, you can't manage those kind of bias, biases, if you don't know <laughs> that they exist. And so there need to be conversations had about, okay, what's reality here? And how can we look at that. Um, you know, it's like 2020 hindsight, right? We always realize later that, oh yeah, we should have seen that. Well, let's try to realize it a little earlier next time. Well, and, and a lot of it had to do with this particular scenario. And again, I don't think it's unlike a lot of other ones um, where the folks are running and gunning and running and gunning. And so you don't have, you, you've probably experienced this early on in, in with your business, you know, but you've been doing this for a long time. So you know, it's been, it's been a while. And, and even same for me, um, 
where it just feels a, a bit sometimes like the, the train is moving. And if you want to stop off and get a drink of water, you're literally like trying to jump off a moving train, go grab the water at the water fountain or whatever, and then jump back on, which means you're either got to hustle back to the same car you were on, or you, you've got to, you've got to just grab it wherever it is at that moment. And that feeling can really, really suck. And that is not a, um, that is not a requirement. That is, that is, that is, there's a conscious way of tackling that and getting the train to work in a way uh, or getting the, the, the business to work at a pace that gives you not only uh, the, the, the peace of mind to not have to hustle that much in, 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 in the sense of, you know, overburden yourself and be always uh, frantic like that, but, but also give yourself enough margin that you can think more deeply about things that you need to tackle or create systems or create uh, uh, or, or, or solve bigger problems that you may end up having um, it, it, because you now have the brain power and the time and the margin and attention to mm-hmm. spend on, on, on those things that ultimately probably have a ripple effect elsewhere in your business. They definitely have a ripple effect elsewhere in your business. Every week on the Marketing in the Raw podcast, I'll share an actionable strategy or tactic that you could use to grow your business. It's kind of like I'm sharing some of the secret sauce from my agency, Secret Sushi. This week, I want to share with you how to go beyond Google Analytics to learn much more about the visitors to your website using LinkedIn website demographics reports. Along with other analytics and tracking tools you might be using on your site, we always recommend adding what LinkedIn calls the Insights tag. By adding this snippet of code, you can go beyond the data found in Google Analytics like total page views and channels that drove traffic to your site. And now you can see information about website visitors such as job title, seniority, the company they work at, the size of that company, and industry of that company. It's all in the website's demographics section of the LinkedIn Campaign Manager. Doing this can help you understand more about the specific people that are visiting a product page, landing page, or a section of your website, and help you make more informed decisions about the website messaging, the lead generation content that you have on that page, adding more clarity to some customer profiles you might be developing, and improve ad targeting on LinkedIn and beyond. Do this by finding and installing the Insights tag found in LinkedIn's Campaign Manager. You can specify pages or entire sections of your website you want LinkedIn to provide data for. Depending on the traffic to your website, in a day or maybe a few weeks, you'll find some data in the website's demographic section inside the LinkedIn Campaign Manager account. You can even compare two website audiences. For instance, the people visiting product A versus the people visiting product B on your website to see how the LinkedIn demographics data compares. And that's this week's actionable tip to help you grow your business. Now on with the rest of the interview with Janet Fout. Um, you, you've written a couple books, and one of the books is "When Life Hits the the Fan," um, and and it, there's an interesting. It's very much about caregivers understanding how to take care of themselves as well. They deserve it. They're they're putting so much of their energy into uh, into those that they that they're taking care of. And um, one of the things you were telling me uh, before the show is that thirty percent of the workforce. You know, thirty percent of any given workforce, on average, is are, are caregivers themselves. They're at home. Uh, just can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So there's a really great study that came out in January of by Harvard, and they really redid a lot of research. And what they found was that it's about thirty percent of the workforce is actively a family caregiver. And as our workforce, as our population ages. Uh, we may be being a family caregiver to an aging parent, someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia. We may have a child at home with special needs. That 30% doesn't even cover those who have children at home. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty big number. And of that number, 80% said that their job had been significantly impacted by being a caregiver. And they also said that they felt they weren't supported, and most of them were hiding the fact that they were caregivers, um, which leads to the second big 
uh, result there was that only 20% of employers say that caregiving has affected their workforce. So they're mostly completely ignorant of the fact that a large percentage of their workforce is dealing with this issue. And the reason for that is because we hide it. We don't tell people every day that we're actively caregiving. We may lose, um, we may lose promotions. We may be uh, not able to do specific tasks because we have other things that are more important. And that we, in our, in our society in the U.S., we haven't really got that balance between the value of our family and our home and our work and finding a way to get those two things to merge and to be able to do both of them together. But we're going to have to because employers are going to have to figure out how they can give support to caregivers. So I have a really big bandwagon on that one, but I'm not going to get on it right now. Well, and, and, and obviously uh, caregivers are, 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 are dealing with something um, uh, very there's a lot of different categories that folks can fall under for mm-hmm. caregivers. And generally speaking that we're really talking about like challenges that everybody's got their own challenges. Everybody's either they're human beings. Many, we, we all know that things happen in our lives that are both temporary and somewhat, you know, permanent or, or even long-term like health issues and that sort of thing. And sort of humans have a multitude of, of things outside of business and possibly even internally within business, of course, that they're dealing with. So how, how does, how does a leader, I mean, where, where does a leader start to, to try to, um, to try to be more conscious of this with their team to try to really, uh, cause I think the result that we were talking about, right. Is, is, is bridging these communication gaps. It's, it's about people taking pride uh, in, in their work a bit, um, possibly staying around longer at, at their, their place of work, um, being more productive. Um, there's a, a lot of these, these things that, um, you can't always measure with metrics, but, mm-hmm. but, uh, but studies have, have, have shown and research has, has shown that they've had an impact on, on, on businesses, let alone the, the feeling of going to work and doing good work for, for your employer. How does a team, how does a, a leader start with, with, uh, making some, taking, making some action on this? Well, you know, we've been hearing a lot more lately about, CEOs who are having lunch with the employees in the lunchroom. We're hearing more about leaders who are making a habit of every day sitting down with one employee for a few minutes just to find out how they are. What's going on in your world? You know, how is your job? But also, how are you? And allowing employees to have a little bit more ownership in the company by giving feedback by not doing 360s where, you know, they do a survey and then somebody sticks it in a drawer, but actual one-on-one 360s where somebody comes in and sits down with a particular manager's team and goes, okay, how do you really think things are going? And how can we move that forward? So it takes a little bit more work to actually have communication and conversations with your team. But when you do that, they're more bonded to you and you have a much clearer idea of what's going on in their lives and what's going on with them at work. And we really can't separate those two. People think that we can, but it's not really true. We may be, you know, having crisis calls over our lunch break or running out to the outside, you know, saying we're having a cigarette break when we're actually dealing with a major issue in our lives. And if we allow that to happen and then ignore it, then that puts a wall up and it starts to kind of drive a shim between the company and the employee, whether that's intentional or not. Yeah. And again, we've identified how often cases it's not intentional. It's just like a way of doing business or, or, or mm-hmm. some people just trying to keep up with, with, with that, with that train. And um, again, it sort of go, it goes back to um, I've never felt that we've been, as sort of aligned and and productive towards the broader goal that we're going after and all of the 
things that we're doing from a, from a sort of more local account management perspective and all the other projects we've got going on internally at the company. And, and that really was uh, because of a, 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 a sort of intention of it's my, it's my responsibility not to tell my team what to do. It's my responsibility to communicate to them. But additionally, it's in that, in that, in that communication exercise, it's, it's my responsibility to listen to what they've, you know, what they've got going on because we've got teammates that have just had babies. We have, you know, teammates that are dealing with like caregiving and, 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 uh, and cars going, you know, kaput and things like that. And those are, those aren't just things that as a, as a leader or an employer, even we, we can just look at it and go, well, well, tough luck, you've got to deal with that. They're all factors that play into things. Um, and, and that doesn't even, that doesn't even play into us utilizing that as a way to produce better services for, mm-hmm. for our clients and do things at, the, at, at work in, in a better way. And I'm really feeling that impact, um, especially this year, um, because of being more, more uh, aware and attentive and again, you know, listening. Well, I think that's an excellent example. Um, You know, the way that you have really brought the whole team in so that they have an idea of what the goals are. When you were, and I kind of didn't address your earlier issue of how am I going to jump back on this train? You don't have to jump back on the train because if you've done your job correctly as a leader, your team's got your back and they're going to reach down, they're going to pick you up and they're going to drag you back on the train because they realize that everyone needs every once in a while to step out. And if you're so critical for your business that you can't step out for a minute, that business is going to fail because at some point you're going to have to step out and something's going to fall through the cracks. But if you've got communicated with your team and everybody knows that we're all moving towards this goal and that person's going to have to go fix their car right now, everyone else will come together and keep the boat moving. But if you split them all up into things where they really aren't connected to each other, they're not as likely to support each other. So it's really about creating a tribe that knows where they're going. It's, 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 uh, it's funny because we talked about this, uh, you know, we've talked about this before, but it still just boils down to some really simple concepts of listening and paying attention and responding after having done those two things I just said previously mm-hmm. and, and the impact that those things have on the relationships with those that you're connected to. And you, you've got the same effect, obviously, for your customers. You have the same effect for, you know, the people, you know, your spouse, your kids, all that sort of stuff. And how can you call the folks that you work with teammates? Uh, let alone, you know, coworkers, especially if you're that the leader of, of, of that team, if you're not, in fact, um, creating the bond that that word implies, you know, for, for moving forward and, and, and making good things happen. Um, so how, how do, okay, tell, tell me some juicy stuff that you're doing right now uh, that help businesses with this stuff. Well, some of the interesting things have been, um, you know, working with teams that have people in-house and they also have remote teams. And it can often happen that the remote teams will be struggling a little bit more to be part of the corporate culture, to have a better idea of how they're incorporated. And part of that is because, and I have worked from home now for almost 20 years. I made my company virtually a long time ago. And we all distributed and we all still kind of work together, but we all have our own businesses. And we still get together periodically. If it's not face-to-face, it's over Zoom so that there is a way for us to connect to each other. We stay connected on social media as humans. And that kind of creates that idea of a tribe. I was working with a company the other day where they had a person that they brought on board to do graphic design. And he had come on as an intern. He did a great job as an intern. They made him an employee. 
but he was working remotely. And the problem that they ran into with him is that he wasn't really spot on with his deadlines. He was missing deadlines. He was not getting things done as quickly as he needed to. And that went on a lot longer than they wanted it to, than the office wanted it to. But they didn't know how to communicate to him because there really wasn't a connection. They couldn't just say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what we're seeing. It got away from them because he was remote and they weren't checking in with him often enough. And when we changed that, we helped them have more regular communication, had them sit down and go over the deadlines and the realistic things that they had to deal with. It was much easier for them to communicate with him. But they had just kind of left him off in his silo and forgot about him most of the time till they didn't get what they needed. That is not a good way to work with a remote team. Uh, I think, I think you, you told me that story recently, or did you have, it was a blog post or, or something like that. It was, it was anyways, yeah, there was a little deja, <laughs> there was a little deja vu. I feel like I've, I've, I've heard that one before and it's a, it's a very good example. It's possible. I did tell it to you <laughs> long ago. Uh, so what, what are, what are you doing right now to, uh, to help folks? Cause you, you've, you've made, uh, I don't want to say a pivot because it's really been gradual and natural evolution from what you were doing as a, as a marketer and a leader of a team mm-hmm. and an agency to, um, helping companies, um, both understand and, and, and implement, um, mindful practices and conscious practices within their business. So what what could somebody who's listening to this um, do if they were talking with with Janet Fouts about this stuff? (laughs) What what problems could they solve? Oh, everything. It'll be all better if all they have to do is talk to me. (laughs) (laughs) Now, realistically, I mean, I have always done coaching with my clients, whether it was around social media, around how they run their business. And eventually that kind of evolved into, we're having some issues with this. And they would ask me for advice. And that really kind of naturally evolved into me being an executive coach and really finding ways to help people reach their goals, to have better communication, to see those cognitive biases and figure out how they could deal with those things. Um, It's helped with employee engagement. It's helped with the way they communicate with their customers. And it's been really great for team building and especially for conflict management because, you know, when we create these silos, we get a lot of conflict. When we get people who don't recognize that they have biases, whether that's an optimism bias or a sunk cost bias, you know, they've already decided what things are going to be and that's what it is and that's all there is to it. And what we kind of do is help them break out of that mold and recognize those things because you can't fix it till you know it's there. Very cool. It, it reminds me of some of what you were talking about, how it's related to this and it's related to that and, and how there's such a big focus these days on customer experience. And one of the most often overlooked sort of elements in your business to impact customer experience is actually, um, is actually employee experience. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so when you improve the, the employees tend to be the connective tissue to a lot of the other things, to the products that are, that are being developed, as we talked about earlier, to, you know, the marketing and the messaging going out there to, to sales and, and, and customer experience itself with the folks that are dealing with cu- customer success um, and, and trying to, to sell your product and communicate to them. And um, when you improve the experience internally for those folks, which um, uh, this has a lot to do with, um, then that has a, a a halo effect to all all of the uh, the other the other elements of customer experience as well. Absolutely. Um, so so Janet, how I know where to find you? I can I, I back you down and follow you and everything. Um, how do other folks find you if they want to ask you questions and talk to you and get your book and all that cool stuff? You can find pretty much everything at Janet Fouts, F-O-U-T-S dot com. Who would have uh, thunk? Who would have thunk? I know, right? Make it easy. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Jay Fouts. Twitter is my favorite 
platform. So if you like Twitter, then that'll be a good thing. And I also just launched a new website called nearlymindful.com, which is where I'm going to be offering a lot of trainings uh, as well as on my main site. That's cool. Actually, you know, we've uh, you, you've had uh, you've got coming up a and by the time this podcast is out, it may be over, but there may be the next one coming up. You've got a, a retreat for folks. Mm -hmm. um, you've you've done a number of workshops, just like you said, um, and amongst many many other things. And so, uh, who knows what will be there <laughs> when the podcast comes up? But you go go check it out and see what there is that's available. Uh, could be could be something big, could be something small, but in either case, it's going to be something that's going to be really helpful. So thanks again, Janet, for, for joining me. I super appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It was fun. It always is. Thank you for spending your time and attention listening to the Marketing in the Raw podcast. I'm Adam Helloway, CEO of the marketing agency Secret Sushi. If you want more marketing insights and advice without all the fluff, Subscribe to Marketing in the Raw on your favorite podcast app and join our Marketing in the Raw Insiders email at www.secretsushi.com. Remember, more leads are good, but more customers are better. Take care.